imagine if I said to you, oh, well, let's all die at 40, like we used to, like many of us used to, you know. Um, would that make your life better? Because we can go back to those days if you want. We can take away antibiotics and vaccines and sanitation. Uh, is life better then? Uh, I would guess that it would not be. And none of us, I don't think, would want to go back 200 years and live with those medicines. So, you know, if you extrapolate that, the longer we live, the healthier we are, it actually makes life better. Uh, and you want to live longer because the future looks even brighter. Dr. Sinclair, thank you so, so much for taking the time to be with us today. This is a massive gift and I am so thrilled to get to chat with you about some of the, the burning questions that I have after being a huge appreciator of your work for, for many years. So I, I wanted to jump in with one that's a little off the wall and focuses on, on death. Um, in your interview in June with Lex Friedman, which is an amazing conversation, there was a discussion about how people largely don't want to think about death. Um, you, I think you said that for, the, for most people, it's extremely distressing for, to, for us to think about our own mortality, and we're actually maybe genetically wired to not think about death. Um, a trend that's been interesting to see recently is that this mindset might be shifting a little bit in part because of the psychedelic renaissance. There's people, usually young people who are seeming to be seeking and finding a sense of existential relief about death through these experiences. We also have a lot of stoic uh, fans on the, on the team um, and who are sort of this concept of memento mori, remembering that you will die, how that can kind of add to our fulfillment of life. And I, I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on these trends. Like, particularly how the booming trend and investment in psychedelics and, and existential experiences will impact the, also the, the concurrent longevity conversation that's happening. Uh, yeah, very good question. Thanks for having me, uh, Ben and Casey and hi everyone. Uh, yeah, so th there are those who think about death a lot, those who don't. Um, I've met a lot of people who don't get uh, excitement out of life because they think about death. They get excitement out of life because they love life. Um, and I'm one of those people. I, I don't care if I'm going to live a hundred or a thousand or a million years. Every day is exciting and new, and I just want to learn more and do more. And uh, so there, there is a group, I would say it's, it's more than half of people that are not excited about life because they know they're going to die. And the other thing I would say is, so I've been alive now for 52 years, which went by super quickly. That's like a blink of an eye. And, you know, what would a hundred years be like? Well, it'd be two blinks. So what would be a thousand years if we could live that long? That'd be 20 blinks of an eye. It's still really short. Um, and so, you know, absent immortality, which I don't believe will have any time within the next few thousand years, uh, we're all going to die. And I think we're, we're going to get, uh, be just as excited about life. I mean, if you all thought you were going to um, live for a thousand years, would you be bored? Would you not show up to this? Would you not be listening to me? I don't think so. I think we take every day as it comes and try to do our best. Most of us do. And the other, the other thing, imagine if I said to you, oh, well, let's all die at 40, like we used to, like many of us used to, you know, um, would that make your life better? Because we can go back to those days if you want, we can take away antibiotics and vaccines and sanitation. Uh, is life better then? Uh, I would guess that it would not be. And none of us, I don't think, would want to go back 200 years and live with those medicines. So, you know, if you extrapolate that, the longer we live, the healthier we are, it actually makes life better. Uh, and you want to live longer because the future looks even brighter. I think that's a beautiful way of putting it. And I think it's interesting, you know, I similar to, to what you're saying, I think hearing test, uh, testaments of people like in the Johns Hopkins studies and whatnot, who have done some of these very deep existential experiences um, that have really relieved a lot of their anxiety around death. You don't end up having this sort of feudalism where people say, oh, well, I'm, I'm fine with dying. And so, you know, I'm not going to try and live it all. It almost seems like the opposite where people um, in engendering in awe for the cosmic journey or whatnot, uh, it makes people even more maybe excited or um, awe, in awe of this existence that we have here. So I think, I think that, that your point's really, 
uh, really resonate. Um, There's one other thing, Casey, which is um, we tend to think that old age is going to be horrible and, you know, God forbid that we become old like that. And so when I say, oh, well, we can make people live longer, people generally immediately jump to that image that I'm going to spend more time in a nursing home and be sick and, and depressed and, and suffer. It's in fact, again, it's the opposite. It's that by doing what Levels is doing for people and what I do, it's about keeping people younger for longer so that in your 80s and 90s, you can still be productive and have a life like you had when you were 40. My father's 82. He lives no life differently than he did when he was in his 30s and 40s. In fact, some in some ways, many times better. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's all about extending the youth, not extending old age. And and when I tell people that, they typically go from, oh, I, I don't want to live beyond 100 to, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll keep living. I, I don't have a, a real limit. And it turns out if, if you're healthy and happy, let's say you've got friends, you've got your health, you've got productivity, you're doing something that you enjoy, it can be community service, whatever. Nobody, nobody wants to die. I mean, how, can you imagine that you wake up one day, you've turned 80 and suddenly you say, okay, I want to die. No, people want to die because they're sick. They're depressed. They don't have any meaning in their lives. They're lonely. And we're trying to make people avoid that. Yeah, I think this kind of gets into the topic of health span, which um, you address so so beautifully in the book. There's a difference between lifespan and, and health span. We really want to extend healthy years. And one of the questions that I'm still grappling with is, really sort of what the limits are of longevity therapy. And, and one thing that comes to mind is that we have this epidemic of children now who have severe metabolic disease. We're seeing fatty liver disease, we're seeing obesity, we're seeing even type two diabetes in children, atherosclerosis um, at young ages, presumably all from really diet and lifestyle since you know genetics haven't changed rapidly. So despite being young and youthful, theoretically having, you know, high NAD levels in their cells or whatever, whatever's going on in their cells to, to make us young. Um, we're still seeing essentially this, this morbidity. So, so sort of just because we can make someone younger doesn't necessarily, we can mean we can make them healthy. So how do you think about sort of the limits of longevity and aging treatments, given that the bodies that these future therapies are going into are highly dysfunctional for the most part due to our food and lifestyle sort of norms in the US. Right. Well, it, it is, it is a tragedy that, uh, the kids are being overfed and fed the wrong foods, um, largely due to marketing, largely due to the, you know, the, the saying that the biggest and most important meal of the day should be breakfast, which I don't, I don't necessarily agree with. Um, and what that does to kids is it, it sets them up for a bad epigenetic clock, uh, and bad epigenetics for the rest of their life. Uh, it's, it's, we know that the clock is ticking from conception. And in fact, it goes very rapidly when you're young uh, and then becomes linear. Um, and so what that means is that, yeah, if you say, oh, it's just puppy fat, you know, Jimmy will lose it when he turns 18 or whatever. Um, even if Jimmy does, it's done permanent uh, damage to the epigenome and that, and five, six, seven decades later, uh, Jimmy's body will feel it. Um, so that's, that's something that most people don't understand. And certainly I would say most parents don't get, and I'm looking to write a book about that, um, about, you know, using these technologies earlier, of course, not malnutrition or starvation, nothing like that, but the, the damage is not just temporary. Um, so that said these longevity treatments, let's take the NAD boosters that we work on. Um, and, and it, it's true for many of the other interventions <clears throat> is that you can, when you, when you slow down aging, you also improve met metabolism um, and you tend to lose weight. So in animal studies, uh, and we'll know in humans, hopefully uh, sometime uh, within the next 12 months that you, you tend to lose weight as well. Um, metformin does this for a variety of reasons. It's thought to be a longevity drug. And so what I think we can do for people is and not just for kids, but even when they're older, um, and there's plenty of older obese people as well that we can give them added, added years, but also improve their metabolism because they go hand in hand. Um, I don't actually, um, well, no, let me take that back in the case of resveratrol, which is the old story from Redline, we were able to protect 
mice from a high fat diet, even though they were still obese. And so there are ways to actually prevent some of the inflammation and damage that's caused by obesity, but it's far better to have a healthy diet, um, eat less often and combine it with the interventions because there we find is the, the biggest bang for the buck. And in the case of the mouse study with resveratrol, when we gave resveratrol and food every other day, that's when we, when we got the, the extreme lifespan extension. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm with you. I, I really uh, feel bad about what's happening to the kids and I would love to be able to help them more. I think, um, you know, a framework that I'm often thinking about is like, what, what is the cell made of? What are the, when we think about diet, it's really just molecular information, right? That's like going into our body, that's bu building our cells. And unfortunately right now we're, we're using poor building blocks. You know, people are vitamin D, magnesium, selenium deficient. You know, we're not getting these things from a diet or we have excess of omega-6 or whatever. And, and that's literally the construction of the cell. And, and so, you know, how to reconcile that, this like poor molecular substrate of the body with therapies that kind of shift metabolism. Um, and at one of the things I think I'm really excited about, like with your work with inside tracker and other sort of biological observability type, um, work is that we can start to understand what, what we're made of, you know, what is the vitamin D level? What, what are the other micronutrient levels? So we can hopefully kind of create that synergy between these therapies, but also sort of our, our molecular structure and see more insight into that, which right now we have very little of. So, um, curious if any, any thoughts. Yeah. Well, yeah. So inside tracker, I, I helped start that company um, about 12 years ago at the time it was considered crazy that you would measure your body. That's something that you do every year with your doctor. Um, now we know that that's, that's very uh, medieval way of thinking and things change month to month, if not day to day. Uh, and you cannot optimize what you don't measure. And that's why levels is super important, um, on a key parameter and inside tracker isn't continuous, right? So that's the disadvantage here. And, but continuous is, is the way it has to go. Um, because measuring yourself three, four times a year, it's okay, but it's, it's not allowing you to change your lifestyle and see what happens, um, with immediate feedback. Whereas of course I've got my levels monitor here. I do that every day. Uh, but yeah, the, the future has to be like that. The, the idea that you go to your, go to your doctor once a year is, is really quite scary. Uh, and, and very soon we'll, we'll certainly see medieval. Um, not only that, what I find is that my doctor at least, um, wants to have the data, but, but the insurance company won't let him pay for it. And so when I show him my data, whether it's, you know, the glucose or the inside tracker, he loves it. We go through the data on zoom and everything. So there's this, um, unwillingness of insurance companies to pay, which I'm sure you're, you're thinking about, but yeah, if, if humanity doesn't go in that direction, then we're going to continue to fly in the dark and we don't know what's working and what isn't. And it, it is really bad that for most people now, 99.9% .9 of people, they might try a diet, they might try exercise, they might change, um, other aspects of their lifestyle, take a supplement that they buy off the web with no real guarantee. And they have no idea if it's damaging their liver. It's working, it's contaminated. Um, and the only way to know that is to measure things. Um, do you mind if I jump in here for a second, Casey, to ask a question? Sure. Um, hi, uh, Dr. Sinclair, Taylor Sibler, um, just joined uh, Levels as head of research. Um, I have a, just, just wanted to push that a little bit further and ask, um, in terms of your health dashboard, when you think about what is important to measure, um, you talk a lot about it in the book and the specific things that Inside Tracker is doing now. What does your health dashboard look like in 10 years? What do you think are the important things that we need to be thinking about now um, so that we can both, it sounds like we need to do both behavior change in terms of um, eating the right diet, maybe doing a cold plunge once in a while, as well as taking the right therapies. So, so what does that dashboard look like for you? Yeah, well, I, I still use Inside Tracker and uh, I just posted on Instagram that I think I broke the record at the company. Um, I didn't realize I was, but, but they saw my post and they said, holy crap, you know, you're a decade younger, more than a decade actually. Um, so that, that was pretty cool. So what have I done to achieve this? Well, it is in the book and I think most of you have read it, uh, but I have changed some, some things since 2019 and I've added some things and I've taken some things away. What I've added 
are uh, oleic acid. Um, I'm taking um, some spermidine now, a gram a day, and uh, uh, some senolytics. So physetin and quercetin we discovered back in 2003 were lifespan extending molecules. And those appear to not just activate CERT1 like resveratrol does, but also kill off senescent cells at high doses. So I have done that. And I'm monitoring myself also epigenetically uh, to see if I'm actually reversing my epigenetic age, which you know from my book is, is one number that's very important. Um, and I am going backwards according to a number of those um, clocks. So that, that's good news that you can send your age backwards, not just slow it down. But actually the biggest change since 2019 is uh, my food intake. Um, I have cut myself back to one and a half meals a day, a very small lunch, a snack maybe late in the day, and then a healthy regular dinner. Um, I'm a struggling vegan at the moment. Um, I don't eat meat, but occasionally I'll take a slice of cheese or an oyster or something. But generally I'm plant-based and I've been doing that only for three months. Um, one of my inspirations, uh, and I, I think some of you have heard of Serena, who and I met her a few months ago and she's been uh, inspiring me with, with facts and knowledge. So I've, I've done that and I've cut out alcohol to see what happens. Um, there are social occasions where I miss it and I think you don't have to cut it out, but I'm doing an experiment. Um, and so that's my life now. I've lost a fair amount of weight. I used to be 149 pounds 150 at max, and I'm now 132. Um, and I feel great. I look great. I have a lot better energy. My glucose levels, instead of doing this, are now through the day. And I have a. I took some photos of the of the, the readings uh, over the last few days, which I can. I think I did. And this is this is a typical me. Um, do you see that? That that very that's nice. Really that's the wrong. That's the wrong app, of course. But I was just at, at dinner. Um, I took a quick snapshot. Um, so that, that's really the thing. And then the Inside Tracker data also says that I'm doing really, really well. I've gone down in age by a few years since I've started on this diet. Um, I miss meat. I wish meat extended lifespan. Uh, I would eat meat all the time, but the data just says that's not going to help. You will feel good, great in the short run. There are a lot of carnivores who tell me I don't know what I'm talking about because they feel great. And if you feel great, that must mean it's good for you. Well, that's not true. Um, what you th have to think about is that there are two states of the body. There's, well, there's three, there's, there's homeostasis, but then you're either in, in, ad in adversity or abundance. Abundance will make you feel energetic and grow your body. So make more muscle. And then there's the adversity mimetics or the adversity signals which these supplements and my lifestyle are aimed at mimicking. And you still have the energy because your body adjusts, but your body fights against aging because it's worried that it might die in a couple of weeks time. And that's what, but what fasting and exercise and the supplements um, and cold and heat are designed to do is to get the body to be afraid of dying in the near future. That's, that's an awesome overview. And I think, uh, one of the things I'm most excited about with personal real-time monitoring is to just totally pull the rug out from under these, these diet wars, you know, carnivore, vegan, I've, I've been plant-based for, for a long time. And, you know, it's it, one of the things that's been so interesting is showing, you know, on social media or whatnot, like these are flat levels with a plant-based diet that it shocks people, you know? And I think, uh, when we can dial that up another notch, like what's happening with your mTOR signaling on a carnivore diet versus a plant-based diet? You know, what, what's, what are your branch chain amino acid levels? Whatever it is to actually start getting more clarity on the longer term sort of lagging indicators aside from just, just glucose stability. Um, so I think um, we're very excited about those, those things as well. And I wanna shift gears a little bit and ask you about um, the future of really like evidence-based medicine. Um, you said something on Joe Rogan, an amazing interview that everyone should watch three hours with David Sinclair. Um, but it was about how a lot of your lifestyle food and supplement choices may actually, or, or, or some of them are extrapolating from animal uh, research and from, from observations of cultures who have lived a long time. Um, and that we kind of can't wait for science to prove it all. Um, 
we're sort of in an urgent, an urgent moment where you got to get this figured out. Um, and, you know, I think this approach certainly can be chastised by the conventional medical community. Like if you're just extrapolating from animals, it's not evidence-based, whereas the RCT, randomized controlled trial, et cetera. So given the new era that's emerging, that's inevitable of personal tracking and monitoring, I'm curious about what your model is for thinking about, um, you know, future validation of therapies and, and what you think the future should like look like in terms of process for validating and regulating new therapies. Like, is it all going to be N of one? Is it going to be different type of RCT? Like, where do you see it going in this new era of, of monitoring? Well, I don't see the, uh, the FDA changing in a hurry. So that's not where the innovation is going to come from as much as they say they'd like to speed the process up. It's still a few hundred million dollars per drug at a minimum because of all of the regulations, which are of course in place for good reason. There have been some terrible historical events where a drug has killed people. We don't want that to ever happen again. Um, but at the other end of the spectrum, we have a hundred thousand people dying every day from age related diseases that. I think could be tackled if we had uh, better ways of, of getting drugs on the market that were more efficient. And by more efficient, I mean less costly. It's so expensive to, to make a drug. Um, that's the problem. And, and sometimes people say, well, what, David, why don't you just stick to your lab? Why do you have to start these companies? Well, that would be great if I could get $500 million in my lab and run a clinical trial, but I, I just can't um, and, and, and get a drug on the market. So I have, if I'm going to make drugs, I have to go out of the academic circuit. Um, but I think we, we now live in an era where we are able to take our health into our own hands and see what works for us and what doesn't. Both as um, individuals buying products that are, that are legal and available online um, or in shops. Of course, that's nutraceutical area. Um, there are some cosmetics that are active as well. Uh, and then when you get into pharmaceuticals, the regulated molecules, you can work with your doctor, such as it's, it's becoming more standard to ask your doctor for, for metformin before you have type 2 diabetes. And those two models will, will continue to play out. But the biggest innovation is going to be, at least until the FDA declares aging a, a, a true disease, which hopefully will happen in the next five to 10 years, um, where the innovation is going to come is that uh, people can uh, look at what works for them. And so when the tra traditional medical establishment says, um, oh, we have to wait till it's proven in a clinical trial, um, I would push back and I would say, nothing is proven in biology. And until you take it, we don't know what's gonna happen. And all drugs are unsafe, in fact. Um, and while it may be safe in a thousand people, there's gonna be one and it could be you that reacts badly. Um, and so it's all about individual personalized medicine at this point. Uh, but to do that, you need to measure things and be very careful about what you choose to put into your body um, and who's supervising you. And my approach has been, and I think this is the one that is becoming more popular, um, is to only change one thing at a time uh, and, then, and then take a reading and see what happens to your body. Do things get worse? Do they get better? Is your liver okay? Are your kidneys functioning okay? Um, is that product from that company okay? And if it is, keep taking that and try something else. And that's why my regime that I have, um, you know, it wasn't just made up yesterday. It's taken over a decade to get to this point, even with the particular brands that I take. Um, you know, it's, it's not perfect, but it is all we have right now. We have to work within the law and, and technology. But I'm, I'm not one of these people that says, I'm going to wait uh, another 20 years till it's proven because uh, first of all, there are going to be a lot of people who die tomorrow. Uh, second of all, I'm I'm probably going to be, uh, you know, fairly sick at that point. My father will be dead for sure if we don't do something. And it's it's like um, you know, people say, oh, I don't know what's going to happen if I take supplement X. Okay, never mind the fact that it's already been taken by a hundred thousand people for the last five years, that it's been clinical trials, it's been in animals for years. You know, there are still some people that say I need, you know, proof. Um, but let's, let's face it. If you, if you wait for that proof, it's going to be too late for most people. And so I, I think just choosing molecules and vendors of very high quality and seeing what happens, you can escalate the dose carefully. That's what's done in clinical trials. I think that's the way to go. Um, 
And that's, that's far better than taking a handful of pills and never measuring anything. You could really be doing yourself some harm. But I would say uh, that's important is, first of all, I'm not a physician. I don't recommend anything. But you do want to tell your physician that you've taken these molecules so that they can make sure that if anything bad happens, they know what to do about it. Yeah, I, I'm certainly excited for maybe also a future world that bridges these to the standard way that we validate things through randomized control trials, but also what does that look like when all of the participants are wearing lots of monitoring technology, you know, and like they're totally hooked up. And so we start to be able to substratify within these populations. Right now it's all about the averages, you know, for the average person, this had a clinical effect and didn't have side effect, you know, which doesn't really work for for the individual. Um, but if if we have that metadata of all the people taking some, you know, drug or therapy or lifestyle intervention, be able to sort of subphenotype how are different groups of people responding based on different biomarkers. Maybe um, maybe there's an avenue there towards, you know, moving within our conventional system of validation towards a little bit more of a, a biological observability framework. 100%. If you have a million people hooked up with biomonitors, uh, you're going to learn within a matter of months what works and what doesn't. Um, yeah. And you can have doctors who agree to do a trial of label to see if a drug works or a supplement with a manufacturer that guarantees that it's pure and uh, and the amount in the capsule is what you say. But 100%, that's that's the way it needs to go. It's just been slow. I, I tried to do this years ago. Um, 15 years ago, I tried to do this. And it's it's just hard. I think the main barrier is that we don't have good monitoring and we don't want to just ask questionnaires. How do you feel? All of that's really not good, but yeah, levels is, is the company that can, can do that for the population and, and not just help with, you know, an N of one totally agree. In terms of that, in terms of more mainstream adoption, I think another question I, I wanted to chat about is like a lot of the movement towards, you know, being able to see inside the black box of the body, increasing biological durability right now is really direct to consumer. We've got like levels, inside tracker, aura, whoop to monitor yourself. You're kind of going outside the system. Um, and so I have two two questions. One is that I think, you know, if if one insurance company starts using some of this tracking stuff and realizes that it's helping make people healthier and costs are cut, it's gonna just be inevitable that that the others are like, oh gosh, we should get on board with this. You know, we can have cost savings, but like, how do you kind of see the domino effect happening um, from direct to consumer into the clinic, into the system? And, you know, semi-relatedly, like what are you seeing right now in your world that is like most exciting and promising um, in terms of, of biological observability? Uh, well, the, the other area are obviously these um, external biomonitors. Um, and those are advancing really rapidly. There are, there's one company I know of, um, it's called bio IntelliSense. You may have spoken with them. Um, I know the CEO well, they have made uh, a couple of products, one's a sticker on the, the chest. The other one is a, a double bigger sticker. They both do, um, ECGs for the heart. They measure motion, um, coughing, breathing. Um, and they have algorithms that are able to now through machine learning, detect whether you have the flu or pneumonia or COVID, you know, and, and it was originally designed for the hearts. Um, but what does that mean when these are, well, the, the other reason that they're, they're important to mention is that they're FDA approved and hospitals are starting to use them to send patients home early for monitoring. Um, so they'll just get better and better and better. And it'll, it'll, there'll be a point where doctors don't just want to send people home with them, but will send them a monitor to wear a couple of weeks before the annual checkup. So at least they have some data to look at when they come in rather than being blind. But where I see the tipping point is that if a device can save a life, for instance, this bio sticker can predict a heart attack uh, a week early, uh, theoretically. Maybe it can, maybe it can, I don't know, but let's say it can. And someone dies from a heart attack and a hospital did not provide it and it cost $20, the family will sue the hospital and say, for $20, you could have saved my father or mother's life. Why didn't you do it? And they, you know, they're going to get millions of dollars in compensation because their father is dead. From then on, 
Of course, every patient will go home with a $20 monitor because it's too dangerous to risk somebody dying without it. I think that's, yeah, that's really interesting. I, you know, I, you can imagine a similar situation, even for something like a continuous glucose monitor, as we start to have in the last 18 months, more adoption of this as a proactive measure. You can imagine people potentially de developing diabetes down the road and saying to their doctor, what the heck, like you're giving me a CGM now, like this would have been really nice 15 years ago or something, you know, and it's like, I, but as the the bottom line also starts, we know how expensive it is the healthcare system when someone has developed a chronic disease like diabetes, um, heart disease, et cetera. And uh, um, this is where I think some really, you know, evidence in this space of showing improved outcomes over time with these preventatively are going to, you know, hopefully help move this forward even quicker. But 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 even those conversations, like what you're talking about, maybe not a lawsuit, but just like people just starting to say to their doctors and be aware of like, wh why didn't I have this earlier? Like this would have been so, so helpful and, and hopefully shifting from the bottom up um, through awareness. So, um, well, Dr. Sinclair, we are so excited to work with you to build this world and this vision that I think we both have and that you described so beautifully in the book. I mean, in the book, just hearing about what your vision for futures doctor's appointments are going to look like and how it's all going to work. It's, it's, it's truly, um, exhilarating and, and we are, we could not be more uh, supportive of your work and more aligned. So thank you for taking the time to chat for a few minutes with me. And I want to turn it back over to Ben because our, uh, members have some amazing questions for you. And so we'll, we'll dive into those, but thank you so much for chatting. Perfect. Thanks, Casey. And thank you, Dr. Sinclair. Very fascinating to listen to the discussion thus far. So uh, the first question from Tracy is around eliminating aging um, as a disease. So Tracy, if you want to dive in a little bit further. Hi, thank you, Ben. And thanks, you guys. This is so I'm just so honored to be able to be part of this. This is awesome. I love the book. Um, the podcasts are great, but they left a lot of questions that even in a long podcast like that, you don't get time to answer. So like a lot of the detail in the book really helped like clarify for me kind of your thinking. And one of the questions I had was about like, if you talk about aging as a disease, as opposed to how we generally think of aging, as kind of like the inevitable decline. Um, how do you you know, how, how, what words do you use to describe advancing in years versus like, if you're reserving aging to imply like disease and this decline as we normally have, like what words do you use to talk about that? And um, in a future world where you can actually eliminate all of these negative physical aspects of aging, then what's left? Like, if you think about someone being born and, and maturing and then getting to a point and then aging and kind of the decline, if you could eliminate all of those like causes of disease of aging, what, where do you get left in, in theory, in terms of like your, your chronological age? And is there a optimal, like chronological age that you would theoretically stay up forever. Like I'm trying to get my head around, what does this actually look like? If everything you said is true and we could figure it out, what is that? What does that lifespan look like? Uh, right. Good question. So that there are two numbers that we have. There's the chronological age and the biological age. Chronological age is simply the number of times the earth has gone around the sun. That's hard to stop. So that's going to tick over no matter what we do, but the revelation, um, and realization of scientists and revelation in the public is that uh, our biological age is different than our chronological age and that we can change it backwards and forwards. In my lab, we can drive aging forwards in a mouse and backwards at will. It's easy. We have control over aging very precisely now. So what does that mean? It means you can choose your own biological age. Um, in the future, you can choose to be 30 and stay 30, choose to be 50, stay 50, but being 50, and biologically 40, which is basically what I am, doesn't mean I'm, I have the wisdom of, of a 40 year old, I have a, the wisdom of a 50 year old. So if you extrapolate, I could be a hundred, you could be a hundred, still have a 40 year old body and have the wisdom of a hundred years of living. That's what's exciting about me. So you've got the biological clock you can control. And then the chronological age 
in my view, just gets better and better with wisdom and experience. Um, so I don't want to stick to any particular chronological age. I don't mind that that advances as long as my biological age is slow and or even steady. Got it. Thank you. Very cool. Well, April is on the call, but uh, she is having some trouble with her audio and video. So I will do my best to provide some color for her question. But it's a really interesting question around um, she works in healthcare. And a lot of times when people are in a certain field, it's hard to communicate broader knowledge to people to make it accessible. So um, the book is very technical. There's a lot of great information, but it's one of those I'm going to read it three, four times so that you can start to be a sponge. Her question is around how do you make this information more accessible and more digestible to people so that they can start to relay it back to the greater community? Well, I'll, I'll address your question. The first, the first comment is um, I didn't want to dumb it down because I believe in the intelligence of humanity, and that's been borne out. It, it was not dumbed down and it still became a bestseller, uh, which to me is, is just great news. Um, I'm writing my second book. Um, I'm, I'm not making it as technical, but I'm certainly not going to talk down to anybody. Um, and I, I am very pleased to hear that m many people uh, do read it multiple times and get more out of it every time. Um, I still read it and get stuff out of it, um, believe it or not. So that, that's, that's the good news. Um, the way to reach more people uh, is to get to the people who don't read books. Uh, I don't know what percentage of people read books. It's, at most, it's got to be 10% at this point. What about the rest of people? Uh, so you can reach them through podcasts, which I've been doing. And uh, I've decided, I did decide, and I've recorded my own podcast, which is coming out in January. And you'll hear me every episode reading an advertisement, advertisement for Levels Health. Um, I can cite, recite for you all the good things about Levels and why I use it. Um, and uh, so there's podcasts. And then and then there's going to be... Um, I'm going to see if I can venture into more mass media without ruining my reputation. I'm, I haven't decided yet how to do that, but it might be a, a documentary or some sort of series on TV because that's really the only way to reach truly millions, tens of millions of people. Um, and that's really the goal here. Uh, but, you know, people digest information differently. Um, and we're all in, a, in the top 1% measuring ourselves, uh, reading a book about aging. There's still a lot more people to reach. And, uh, and we'll just keep going down the various levels of medium. Um, I didn't mention social media, but that's probably the best way. And that's why I have built up a following on social media because not because I, I care about the numbers and for my ego, it's because it's a platform to reach people that you normally wouldn't be able to reach. And that has a, has been a real revolution in my ability and scientists ability to talk to the public directly before, I mean, you know what it was like 10 years ago to be a scientist. It was a nightmare. Uh, we would talk to a newspaper, they would have an agenda. They'd write a stupid title, especially with aging. Harvard researcher says we're all going to live to 200. And it would just be embarrassing to my colleagues, to me. It's different now. I barely ever talk to a newspaper. I talk directly to the public through social media and through podcasts. And that's the best way. Love the headline that you've provided some color on because you can visualize it exactly happening. But now there's, there's more agency and license by you owning the platform, by you having the platform to provide color so that the information you put out is on your behalf as opposed to something that may, might be misconstrued in, uh, in the way it's approached from a media standpoint. Um, to highlight one thing you said, so very cool about thinking the way we can make information more digestible with other forms. I, I listened to the audio book and loved how you had the... Um, the standalone pieces of just discussing it with your co-author and it made it feel more digestible to think like, how did you come to some of these conclusions for each chapter? So really enjoyed that and thought that was quite beneficial. Um, Lisa has a question that I think regardless of the industry somebody is in, we all wonder who do the thought leaders look up to as thought leaders? So Lisa, if you want to jump in, it's a very interesting question. 
Yeah, I, um, I'm just wondering who is your HG Wells or Gene Roddenberry of the day? Like, who are you listening to? What are they saying? Um, what is it? What are you finding intriguing or interesting or um, maybe something that is not confirming something that's against kind of where your your thought process is going? Uh, my answer is going to shock some of you and for the rest of you, it's going to disappoint you. Um, I go around the world giving talks and often I'm, I'm told you should read this book or you should watch this movie. Uh, it's exactly what you're talking about. Uh, I went to the Pentagon many times and they said, oh, this is just like this movie. And my answer is, uh, I haven't read the book and I haven't seen the movie, but it sounds great. Um, I, the closest I've seen probably is Gattaca. But um, here's the sad thing is that uh, I used to have a lot of time to read fiction and a lot of science fiction, but I don't do that anymore. It's probably because of time, but it's also because um, I like imagining my own future. I'm very good at imagining things. Um, and I, I'd rather, to be honest, not be contaminated by other people's visions of the future. I might get locked into something that's someone else's idea. And it's the, it's the same for science. I like going to conferences. It's great. Um, but I try not to get distracted by too much other stuff and get locked into the dogma because dogma is typically wrong. And I'd rather be this uh, free flowing mind and just let it expand. So usually what I do when I'm talking about the future is, is with people, um, guys like Brian Green and Lex Friedman, um, George Church, who's in my department. Uh, we, we talk and dream about the future together. Um, and that's my main inspiration. The rest is just what I dream up in, when I'm lying in bed at night, thinking about what the future should be like if, if it was a perfect world. Um, speaking of a perfect world, I got to chat with uh, William Shatner last night, which was a real thrill for me because I, I, as a kid, I was inspired by that somewhat perfect world. And I still feel like we are aiming to get there. Um, and that, that may be what drives me each day is that knowledge that humans can do better. And I just want to want us to get there as fast as possible. Awesome. Thank you for that. Uh, next is Eva. So Eva has a, maybe a bit of a philosophical question around how longevity pertains to things like natural resource consumption, climate change, and our impact on the world. So Eva, if you want to jump in. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Sinclair, I know that you talked a bit about this in the second part of your book, um, kind of answering the question of if we live longer, what happens to our planet and and um, and can it sustain us um, so many people at once? Like, it would be awesome to see your great, great, great grandkids, but are we um, perpetuating the decline of our planet um, in that process as well. I know you've, you've touched on this quite a bit in the book, but I'd love to hear any current thinking that you have on this as well. Yeah, thanks. Um, I do think about this every day. And, and since I published the book, um, somebody said something that stuck in my mind, which I want to repeat. Uh, they said, when you hear about the news for a cure for childhood leukemia, the reaction isn't, oh, that's going to ruin the planet with all these kids staying alive. So why do we have, the say, have that reaction when we're trying to keep middle-aged and older people alive? So that's one. The second thing is I've put some numbers where my mouth was or my head was um, and published a, a Nature Aging article on the cost savings of extending lifespan by a year or 10 years in the US. And the, the, the value to the economy over the say, 30 years after that discovery would be in the trillions of dollars. Um, and I mean, the numbers are actually 86 trillion for a year and 365 for 10 years. Now that's a lot of money that's currently wasted on what I call sick care, not healthcare. And that money can be put towards education, developing new technologies to treat uh, or prevent climate change. Um, that's a lot of money. And it really is all about the allocation of resources and money. You know, humans can achieve anything and they can either be making widgets or repairing crashed cars or, I don't know, pumping oil out of the ground. 
but uh, if you have money to spend on other things, you can put people to work on really productive things um, rather than things that are just currently uh, perhaps too expensive. And if we save this money, we can, we can use that wisely. Um, in terms of population growth, a lot of people worry that we're going to be overpopulated and the numbers just don't pan out. We're already in most of the world approaching levels um, of replacement and actually in the US and Europe, we're actually declining. Japan's already in that process. And that's a disaster for the economy if we don't do something about it. Our kids and our grandkids are going to suffer badly economically if we don't do something to keep people productive for longer. And that's what we're talking about here today. Perfect. Dolph has a question around uh, the potential downsides to taking NMN uh, later in life. So Dolph, if you want to provide some color. Yeah. Um, I thought it was a really compelling story in the book and uh, a better pill to swallow. You talked about um, your dad and his experimentation with that. And I'm just curious when he told you that he was going to go down that road, what scared you about that? What were you worried about? Um, yeah, if I was worried about it, I, I would advise him not to do it. Most of my, actually all of, all of the things that I do are based on, uh, on the knowledge that it's extremely, extremely unlikely that it's going to do any harm. Um, I typically take molecules that have been in the body already for millions of years. NMN has been in the body for billions of years and what we are doing by giving NMN is replacing what's lost with age. Um, speaking most generally, tissues decline in their NAD production, NMN being a precursor um, by about 50% by the time you're my age. And I, I can raise those back up. And we actually, I actually know a lot more than the public thinks about the effects of NMN on the human body. I've been helping do clinical trials for about three years now. Uh, and we know it's safety um, to some extent. We know uh, how much it raises NAD in the body, in which tissues, uh, and we'll even have some efficacy uh, results uh, to tell you about next year. Uh, in mice, it extends their lifespan, it, it appears. We're doing more mice, but it looks really good, especially in females. And uh, it reduces um, obesity, improves lean mass, improves their metabolic flexibility, and delays their frailty, which is based on 20 measures of health, including hearing and eyesight. So based on all of that, I've had no issue with my father choosing to take it. I couldn't stop him. He's a grown man. He's a scientist himself. Um, but I don't have any concerns. There is something on the internet, unfortunately, that like a lot of stuff on the internet, that's just hype. Uh, it's in the same realm as metformin prevents you from building muscle. This one is that NMN will make your cancer grow more. It comes from a study from Washington University where they uh, depleted NAD from uh, brain cancer cells and they grew slower. And the PR department of WashU put out a press release saying NAD makes cancer cells grow. Well, yeah, right. Uh, you know, that's, that's kind of a, a misreading of the data, especially when you need NAD for life. So having less of it, of course, is going to make cancer cells grow slower. But giving them more doesn't seem to do that in our hands. We've tested it in a couple of cancer models. You know, in an abundance of caution, if you had a tumor, I wouldn't take NMN because we don't know. But if you're healthy, right now, there's no evidence that it should have any negative side effects. The biggest side effect that we've seen anecdotally is in perimenopausal women. It might um, improve the health of the ovaries and put out more hormones. They tend to have shorter uh, menstrual cycles and, and heavier ones. Um, but other than that, uh, and that's consistent with our mouse studies showing you can reverse infertility in old mice. But other than that, I don't know of any downsides taking NMN and we haven't seen anything in the clinical trials either. That's great. Uh, Maria has a question around lifespan and any research uh, pertaining to mental health. So um, anyone who has a genetic predisposition towards mental health, um, and, uh, Maria, you can provide more color to the question, but teeing it up for you. Hi, um, thank you so much for being here and, and taking the discussion. Um, I think extended lifespan and health span is so remarkable and I love the book. 
and really am excited about it. Um, but And I didn't even really think about this, but I do have a brother with severe mental health challenges. And daily life is really a struggle for him. And I wondered if in all of your research or thinking about this, I mean, it's really exciting when you're really healthy and you have everything going for you. But if, if daily life is a struggle in that respect, and it it's probably environmental, probably genetic, he's had it for a very long time. But I just wondered what your thoughts were in that in that area. Yeah, well, we talk a lot about aging, but actually what we've discovered are the body's defenses against disease. Um, and that's not just age-related diseases. It can be applied to enhance the resilience and defenses of the body, even in children. Um, NMN, or at least a version of NMN is being tested now in a disease called Friedrich's ataxia um, as part of a company that, that I started out of my lab. And that's just an example. Of, and that, that disease affects uh, kids in their teens through to their thirties, they end up in wheelchairs. And so that what gives me hope is that these molecules should be able to help people of any age with potentially, I wouldn't say any disability, but it's pretty broad from reducing inflammation. We've seen results in humans already with an, a certain one activating molecule um, through to uh, mental uh, uh, problems. We, we do see improvements in blood brain flow in animals and we're testing this in people now. Um, and perhaps even uh, changes in mood we, we see some evidence that it improves uh, positivity um, as well. But yeah, I, I would say that we talk a lot about helping healthy people stay healthier, but that's really just one part of what we're hoping to do with the science. That's great. We've got another question here from uh, Natalie. So Natalie, I think you're still on on the call here, but uh, it's around ethnicity and some of the research pertaining to lifespan and longevity. Yeah, you know, we're, we're still in the dark ages there. We got, we as a field, we've only just started using females in our studies, um, let alone people from different races. And I, we live in, an, in a time where that's very for, uh, you know, in, in our, the forefront of our conversations. But because it takes a while to get results um, from clinical trials, we're still in the dark actually about that. Now, I'd be surprised if there are not ethnic differences, racial differences. In mice, even inbred strains of mice um, have different effects uh, when it comes to calorie restriction. Some calorie restriction protocols will hurt certain strains of mice and others will live longer. And that's until we have the data on the effects of different ethnicities, it's even more important that individuals measure them themselves to make sure that what works for a white male will also work in a, you know, African American female, for example. Um, it's also we also look at data, typically at levels and at, in, at Inside Tracker, from the wealthier part of society, and they skew ethnically as well. And so we have to remember that there's a whole other group of people that that are not typically uh, being uh, equally measured. Um, and my goal would be, hopefully yours too, is to, to democratize this and get it out to, to everybody as, as fast as we can and as cheaply as we can. Awesome. There's one, um, one last question here, and Taylor is going to jump back in with uh, a few questions. But there is one part in the book, and now I can't remember if it was the book or the... Um, the side conversations that you have with the co-author, but you said it, it's so interesting to write a book that is research-based because it's just evolving so quickly that it's like, by the time you've written something, the chapter, the last chapter you wrote, you're like, I want to go back and change that, but you have to button it up and put a bow on it um, eventually. And so Tim had a question around, um, is there anything that you wrote in the book that your outlook has drastically changed just because research is evolving so quickly? And it sounds like when you were saying it, it was like on a daily basis, you're like, oh my goodness, this is brand new. So I uh, would love to hear some thoughts on that. Sure. Well, the, the good news is that the basic scientific principles, if anything, are much stronger than 2019. 
um, many of you will have seen that the field of epigenetic reprogramming and age reversal, since our paper came out um, in Nature a year ago, it's just a, the field's exploded. You know, with, with the likes of Jeff Bezos and um, Brian Cunningham from Coinbase getting involved with lots of money, there's been at least $20 billion invested since our paper came out. Um, I can't take credit for it all, but I, I certainly didn't hurt. So that's been a big change since the book. So, but the fundamental science is the same. So that's that's great because I wrote the book when epigenetics and aging was not even on the radar for most people. Um, so that's held up. The interesting thing though was that the science that's in the book was was written and published in the book before the scientific paper came out in Nature, which I think doesn't happen very often. Uh, luckily, I didn't get destroyed there by my colleagues for doing that. Talk about scooping yourself. Uh, but if you ask me what's the big change, well, I predicted that there was going to be a pandemic at the end of 2019, three months later, it came out, four months later. Um, I wish I was wrong about that. So my thinking about that was um, that this was going to be sometime in, in the future, maybe 10 years. I was wrong. It came months later. Um, my thinking actually has evolved also to be, I think I was too conservative. I didn't realize that the amount of attention and money uh, would come into this field. And you can achieve a lot with $20 billion. That's like putting the whole NIH on, on one topic. And so I think my timelines might've been out. I thought I was already optimistic. Matt LaPlante was pushing me to be super optimistic. And I did, but I, I really think that it's possible now that we will be able to reset many parts of our body within our lifetime. But um, yeah, I think I, I, I'm much more optimistic. I now believe that with this infusion of research dollars and development of drugs, that's going to happen. Uh, we might within the next 10 years have the ability to reverse the age of certain organs, perhaps within 20 years, the whole body. Um, already there are people, doctors that are claiming to have sent their age back by 10 years um, based on the blood methylation clock. I've seen it in myself that I've gone back according to those clocks by at least a couple of years. Um, and that's all you need to do every year to have a big effect on lifespan. That's great. Well, we'll turn it over to Taylor. He has a few questions. And if any, anyone else has questions, please uh, put them in the chat and we will get through a couple more. We do have um, another 30 minutes booked. We don't have to go the entire time if, uh, if we're light on questions, but feel free to chime in while Dr. Sinclair is here. So there's a telomere question. I'm sorry. Oh, you go ahead, Taylor. But I, I see a question from Julie in the chat. Oh, sure. We can do that first. Let's do it. Um, so I don't, I don't know what 14.5 was for telomeres, but, um, so telomeres were the old way of measuring aging, and they're still somewhat relevant. Some aspects of aging do seem to be important for uh, the health of the body, the immune system, the liver. But what we've, the scientific field has found is that telomeres uh, actually do grow and shrink. You can lengthen them. They do bounce around a lot more than the epigenome does. Um, I think ultimately, if we're going to live for hundreds of years, we have to address telomere length. But I, I think that the, the best path to, to this is to work out how to reprogram the epigenome and that'll actually take care of things. We find that we can regrow telomeres when we reprogram cells to get younger, the telomeres will grow longer. Um, the gene expression gets set back to 80% of what it was, or at least 80% of age. Um, there are some, some drugs and, and some supplements that are in clinical trials that look somewhat pro promising as well. But that, you know, I know that that's not a perfect single uh, binary answer, um, but the summary would be that, yeah, we have to address those at some point, but I think that what we're working on in the reprogramming space can take care of that and the other eight hallmarks of aging. That's great. Um, and that's actually a really good segue to where I was hoping we could go for a little while. Um, the, I mean, I think you're actually are, you, you are pioneering this work. But if, if we do, so let's, let's zoom ahead a couple of years and the FDA has now finally, or, you know, medical societies and the FDA are finally accepting that aging is a disease, right? 
we, we now have that uh, designation. We now, just like with cardiovascular disease, with diabetes, we need to establish what the biomarkers are and the subclinical to clinical, it's a, it's a chronic disease, right? So it goes over some period of time and what, and then we need to have diagnostics and therapeutics that are, that are going to be given uh, over that course. So what are the, um, what's the process? Like if, if you have to, you know, none of us love the way that clinical trials are designed. You, you talked about the fact that, you know, lots of different people are left out of those trials. Um, what, what would be the process that you'd want to implement for this new designation and, and in uncovering and, and treating this new disease? Uh, would you stick with the randomized control trial? Would you do the end of one trials? Should we be thinking about something else? Yeah. Well, I can, I can think of at least a few stages. The first stage is what we're doing now, which is N of one studies showing at least in some individuals that with, with your own self as your negative control starting point, measuring, um, blood biomarkers, including glucose, but also, and including, um, epigenetic age and telomere length, that's still part of the determinant of your ultimate longevity and, and learn that way very quickly already in the, in, over the last year, we've seen some, some successes. We've actually seen also some published papers where changing lifestyle, Mediterranean diet, exercise, some supplements, alpha ketoglutarate, uh, seemingly reversing, um, slowing, if not reversing age. So that's, that's stage one, that's self-experimentation or in a small clinical trial with each person being their own um, control. The next stage would be to have hundreds and perhaps I said you know, millions of people who are being monitored and then you give them intervention A and not intervention or a group that has not no intervention. And then you can learn that way in, in lots of people. And that would be done um, perhaps in the, by the public rather than in a hospital setting. And that would be a lot quicker and cheaper, of course. And then the third way would be the traditional way, but that's, that's expensive. A, a trial would be 30 to $50 million, but the standard way would be double blind placebo control intervention. People come into the hospital, get measured, and you have to do multiple hospitals um, and run it for four or five years and have a look at their frailty. Of course, all the, the biomarkers that we want to measure in the previous studies I mentioned. And then um, if you do enough people, uh, you can actually also do lifespan, but that's, that's a lot of people. That's, that's thousands of people over age 70 that you need to do that. But at a minimum through all of those, those three steps, we'll have a good idea as to whether aging can be slowed in humans. Will it be proof that you can extend lifespan? No, there you need, um, really a lot of people, um, and, uh, and done under double blind placebo controls, which is tough, right? If you're doing it for a decade, it's not easy. So that would be stage four, but I think we'll get there in our lifetimes. We'll be able to say that this molecule extends lifespan. And in the meantime, we are relying on these, um, epidemiological studies such as metformin, where tens of thousands of people have been looked at and they live longer on, uh, type two diabetics live longer on metformin than people who don't even have type two diabetes and don't take the drug. Uh, which is an astounding observation, but the real proof, if you want to call it proof, has to come from prospective studies, not retrospective. Got it. No, that's super helpful. Um, and then let, let me push a little bit on that second type of study that you talked about coming where we can monitor millions of people. Um, if, uh, you know, well, in order to, in order to do that well, we need to be able to um, draw some kind of a conclusion that's beyond just a correlation, right? We need to be able to get some, some type of evidence that's not randomized controlled trials. Um, the, well, actually, I, I'm going to pause because we're, I think this is going to get technical too quickly. So rather than go into the, the mechanics of clinical trials, I think um, there, there comes a point in time with many diseases where um, biomarkers can be synonymous with the progression of the disease. So like you were saying, it's very difficult to get to the point where we could definitively show that we're 
improving lifespan, right? Or we're improving health span. Um, but if we, we take it for granted now that, for instance, if I give a population statins and I'm able to reduce the cholesterol, that's taken as, as reducing the incidence of heart attacks. How long do you think it will be before we can take certain biomarkers of aging, e.g. the epigenetic clocks that you're doing, and, and be, have, a, have enough confidence that those will actually be reducing or, or extending health span? All right. Well, we already know from Horvath's work and others that certain lifestyles will accelerate the clock and others will re re reduce it. And that's looking at thousands of people. Um, so unless you're a total skeptic and you're just a glass half empty kind of person, you've got to look at that data and say those, and, and by the way, Horvath's clock like grim age uh, predict your longevity that way. Uh, and, um, even how long you, you know, you're going to live from that point. So you've got to look at that data and say, okay, the clock is valid. You know, it's got 5% error, but still you got to believe that it's measuring something related to your actual aging and your future health. So I think we're already there. I think that these clocks need a bit more development. Um, we need them in more people, but I have no doubt that we're going to be able to use these clocks to predict someone's future health and longevity. It's already done in various studies, which means that if you reverse the clock and in multiple clocks, I don't just mean a blood test because your blood might improve, but your brain might not. We need a way to actually test multiple tissues. It could be a cheek swab, spit, might be a muscle biopsy in some people just to test and also blood. But at least you need to see it happening in multiple parts of the body to be more convinced that this is true. Um, but with that, I, I think that um, at least if you're not skeptical in the next five years, we'll have a number of interventions that are well established and well accepted to slow down. Um, and if not reverse and, and also reverse aging, including alpha ketoglutarate, which looks promising. Senolytic molecules look promising for true age reversal. That's different than saying, oh, the mainstream medical establishment and the FDA agree that will take many more years. And we know from the TAME study, the metformin uh, study that near Rarsla is heading, is that the, while the FDA is open to the idea of calling aging a disease, they need to see that you can reduce markers that are agreed upon that represent age, which includes frailty, uh, cognition, um, and some blood biomarkers as well. And that's, that's a lot of work, it's very expensive. So. It's different. I think acceptance within the, our community is pretty much going to happen in the next few years. Doctors will probably take maybe seven to 10 years, and then the FDA could be even longer, but I hope I'm wrong about that. Yeah, I, I, I think it's a question of how quickly we can get the medical societies engaged. Right. That's well, we're, we're, yeah, you know, I, I, sound, I sounded a little bit conservative there. I think with the, the, the pace that we're learning to educate people with the books, with the podcasts, with uh, just people talking about this, it's, there's a lot of buzz. I hope that we can accelerate this. But so far, it's, it's, it's happening at a grassroots level rather than the top down. Yeah, that, that was actually my next question was, do you see any signs yet from the traditional medical community at the moment? Because, I mean, you know, you've got a couple doctors here on the call we're in, but um, we certainly don't look up the majority. Right. Well, talking to my circle of, of advisors and friends, uh, there's been a paradigm shift in the way they think. But of course, my circle is not representative. I haven't taken a survey. That would be a good thing to tweet today to see what happens. If you're a doctor, what do you think? Um, I have faced the opposite. I faced criticism, in particular from one doctor through direct messaging, that uh, you sh nobody should be allowed to use a glucose monitor unless they have type 2 diabetes, mm. to which I replied, and, and then tweeted, um, that'd be like saying, uh, people shouldn't have a, a, a bathroom scales in their bathroom to monitor their body weight. You know, who's to tell us what we can measure and what we cannot. But hey, anyway, you know where I sit on this, but there, there certainly are these really strict opponents, even with calling aging a disease, there's, I had to just, I'm gonna be publishing in the Lancet, a letter saying, uh, please don't reverse the decision to call aging a disease at the World Health Organization because there are some 
vehemently oppose doctors that say aging should never be considered a disease. Um, and I didn't even know what it hurts. I don't know why they're offended. You know, it doesn't seem to hurt anybody. I think just people don't like change. And this is an example of that. But I, I couldn't tell you, you might have a much, you probably have a much better idea of what percentage of doctors are on board with home monitoring of blood glucose versus uh, those that are not. Well, I mean, I, I have to say it's been a slow shift, but um, the numbers are increasing. And I think part of it is that the, these services that incorporate glucose monitoring are, um, are now getting traction across the board and they're now publishing studies. And I, I, I feel like the, the key to shifting doctors' minds is just to, you, you just have to have this formula for producing the output and creating studies in a way that they can understand. And then it becomes part of the medical education. Um, it's, uh, yeah, and, it, and it, it will be slow, but, but it's, it's coming. I, have a, I see a question that's, that's interesting. That's perfect. We'll let you choose because if there's something interesting, we're all going to have a gap in our mind of what does Dr. Sinclair think is an interesting question in the chat. So um, I know there are a couple in here, but take it away with whichever one you want to answer first. Um, I'll go quickly uh, and answer them all, hopefully. So the, the question in the chat is about whether um, anything that we work on can impact COVID. So first of all, COVID very likely accelerates aging. It accelerates cellular senescence. Um, we see that in my lab. We can counteract that by deleting the senescent cells. And there are physetin and quercetin are, are two possible ways, in at least in the uh, supplement world. So that, that's one issue. The other thing that the virus does is it depletes NAD massively. If you Google it, you'll see there's a lot of papers on this. And uh, there are some uh, case studies at hospitals where patients have been given NMN and they've recovered rapidly. And so we're doing, well, Metro Biotech is doing a COVID-19 NMN trial right now um, and also to protect kidneys as well, which is a problem for some patients. So those are the two things I think uh, NMN might help, certainly uh, recovery, and uh, cellular senescence is a problem, and so senolytics might address long COVID. Um, but yeah, when, I think it's important that people know, tell your family and friends that uh, if you have, if you get a bad case of COVID, it, it might accelerate aging, and they'll if they don't haven't had the vaccine, they'll probably go get one after they get that. Um, let's see, the blue zones, um, yeah, so. I, I totally agree that the science says that the environment is important, your social environment, your stress levels, cortisol we measure, I measure in my body, I try to keep that low. Now, it's, it's very clear that the data says that you need a social environment to live really long. Now, it can mean having a, a great partner you can rely on, or if not, or and have a, a pet that you come home to. These are all shown to be great for longevity. And actually, there's a study that's worth noting, which is that at Harvard, they followed, these were men, they followed them after World War I, I think it was, maybe it was World War II. Anyway, it was for their whole lifespan and looked at their health. And the one thing that was in common with the people that lived a long time was to have a reliable partner. And to me, that, that's striking. You know, it wasn't just what they ate, how much they exercised, it was the partner that was important. Um, so yeah, I, I think being lonely, really will accelerate aging. So big emphasis on that, big emphasis on the mind, meditation, peacefulness, mindfulness, calming yourself, not stressing about life too much. That's a quick way to accelerate aging. Uh, Plant-based, yep, definitely a fan of eating uh, at least one fewer meals a day. I skip breakfast. I've done most of my life skipping breakfast. And in the last year, I've started skipping lunch if I can. Most days I do that. Um, I'll have some nuts or, or a supplement drink, athletic greens or something like that, um, or just add water as another product. Um, and then I get through to dinner and I have a, a nice dinner that's hopefully vegan, um, if not vegetarian. Uh, and then let's see, all oh, the stacking. So I, I do think that taking multiple supplements and doing multiple things such as exercise and cold bath has an added benefit. Now, do I have proof of that? No, because trying to do that clinical trial is, is never going to be possible. You need a billion dollars to do all of that and individually. But what I've done is I've 
I've added things on sequentially. And so I've been slowly stacking these things over my life, over my adult life to a point where I've gotten to where I, I probably take 10 supplements a day and my health has never been better, literally never been better since in, I was in my thirties. Uh, and my age is, is, uh, calculated to be much younger. And I, I doubt that that would be possible by taking one thing. In fact, I know that it's not true because when I only took one thing, it was very troll. I wasn't this healthy. And then I added NMN and metformin. It was great, but it, I didn't get down to these levels. So all of these things, including my diet and my exercise have gradually been getting me younger and younger over the last decade. Um, cutting meals. Yeah. Athletes, there's, there's a real question around athletes. I don't agree that metformin should be cut out of any plan unless maybe you want to be Mr. Universe or Miss Universe. Actually, Mr. is the only way that's an issue. Um, so metformin, if you dig into the data, metformin only reduces the size of muscles by about 5%. And it's probably only because you feel a bit weaker on that day because uh, it interfe interferes with your mitochondria. But other than that, you can take metformin on days you don't exercise. It seems to be fine. And it's only a 5% difference. So unless you're Mr. Universe or extremely vain, 5% you won't even notice. And those muscles actually on metformin were healthier, just as strong and had less inflammation. So I'm, I'm a proponent of actually reading the data and not going on these rumors that are on the internet. Um, cutting meals as an athlete. Well, I think that you can still do it. You don't want to do it on the day that you're running probably, but it's amazing what the liver can put out in terms of glucose, you see those levels, mine are very steady. That's because of gluconeogenesis in my liver. But on days that you, you run, you want to have more energy than just in your liver, especially if it's a long distance one. Um, so I would say you don't want to skip meals on, on tr super training days um, or competing days. But I, I would encourage you to, to look at the, the documentary. Uh, what is it called? Somebody remind me, something games? Oh, um, um, the one with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Game changer. Game changer. Game changers. Yeah. Yeah. And there you'll see that a lot of athletes do just as well, if not better on a plant-based diet. Um, so any thoughts on, uh, the impact of C60 fullerenes? So I am, I'm open to the possibility. Um, I know the, the lead author, I am, um, I've talked to him about it. I'm currently. Interestingly, no one knows this, but I'm currently trying his product, which has oleic acid fused to C60. And I'm going to see if it helps or not. If it doesn't, I'll stop. If it does, I'll keep doing it. Um, but the effects were dramatic. There was a, a I, I think it was close to 30, 40% lifespan extension. It was crazy. So I'm, I'm open to, oh, you're 90%. There you go. That is truly insane if it's true. Um, What's the mechanism? Well, iron, I think, um, it thinks that it's also mitochromesis in the same way exercise, hyperbaric oxygen, and uh, metformin create a disruption in the electron transport chain that leads to free radicals that creates mitochromesis and you get health that way. And uh, it, he could be right about that. I, have, I really don't know if that's true, but that's his theory. But I am just to, to give something that is useful, more and more mechanism points to mitochromesis as a productive way to boost longevity. And that's why I'm bullish on exercise and metformin as ways to do that. So this is this is fully qualitative in the sense that in, in places like blue, the blue zones, um, let's make an assumption that most people they're very laid back. They consume different food. It's a very different lifestyle. But there's also this sense that in these smaller communities, there might not be the same media consumption that we have in North America or in Europe or any of these um, any of these countries or on the continents where people almost get obsessed by media consumption, which is raising cortisol levels and you become consumed by it. We saw it happen with the pandemic. How much of what goes on in the blue zones do you think has to do with versus let's just say North America has to do with um, longevity? Like, or is that, is that something that, that comes to mind? I mean, the, the access to, to social media and, and other types of media 
affects it, them. Becoming oh. obsessed, like as a as a society, there's a societal obsession with always consuming um, maybe things that aren't positive in the news and aren't everyone's just immersed in this. And when you're in that mindset, something you alluded to, when you're in that mindset, you're elevating your cortisol and you're just you, you become wrapped up in um, the negative of the immediate versus having a, a 10,000 foot view of I'm present in this world. I think there's a lot to that, that your cortisol levels and possibly other molecules we haven't discovered yet are circulating in your body when you're on this, in this heightened, uh, fright or flight state, which, you know, based on my, my surveys of people that I meet reached its height, um, during the Trump administration and the election. And since then, a lot of us, including myself, have gone cold turkey on consumption of the news. Um, and I've been, just speaking for myself, much healthier. My cortisol levels have gone down um, and my mental state is so much better. I even talk slower um, than I used to. I mean, a more zen-like state. But before it was, oh my goodness, how many people have died today? What's gonna happen? World's gonna blow. That's not healthy at all. And I, it, I can easily imagine it to be true that that reduces the longevity of an entire country that's watching it versus, or at least communities that, that focus on it versus those that don't. And what, what you hear also from people who live a long time is that they don't worry about things and they don't consume huge amounts of media. And often they say it's their sense of humor that has gotten them through. Uh, and that's a common theme with these uh, centenarians. And at, actually it's one of the few things that's common. You know, often they, they smoke, they drink, they do bad things, but uh, being relaxed and having brushing off problems and not worrying is, is one of the things that they all share. Looks like we have one more question here from Casey. If you wanna wrap it up, Casey. This is just, Kind of a, a, an off the wall. I went to this talk this weekend at a at a longevity conference about uh, that was talking about this Grim Reaper clock in the pineal hypothalamus, um, and that pineal calcification, which can happen from long term exposure to melatonin, is sort of upstream. The theory in this talk was it was sort of upstream of everything else uh, with with cellular aging. Just curious, like how sort of structural changes like that that may be irreversible, like pineal gland calcification relate to what's happening more on the cellular and epigenetic level. And if we can kind of bypass maybe central changes with more downstream therapeutics that affect the epigenome and, and whatnot. Yeah, there's a, a bunch of problems with, uh, with melatonin. And I'm, I'm guilty as, as, as anyone of taking melatonin. Um, I probably do that three, four times a week. Um, but I, I also am paying attention to this new data that looks like uh, calcification is a major problem, not just for Alzheimer's disease, but for normal aging as well. You get calcification, reduced volume of the pineal gland, and then you get decreased melatonin, and then you, you take more melatonin, and it just makes things worse. And you're going to reduce neurogenesis in the brain, increased inflammation. It's just not, not a good uh, uh feedback loop at all. Um, in some countries, they don't allow you to have melatonin. I'm Australian originally, and you just can't buy melatonin. It's funny that it's available over here and it's a hormone. Um, so I'm cutting back my melatonin consumption and using other methods to go to sleep. Uh, I now am mostly using uh, GABA and L-theanine um, and some magnesium if needed. Uh, I've taken myself off alcohol and Ambien that I used to need to get to sleep, uh, which of course are extremely toxic and addictive uh, substances. And so that, that's the overall theme, which is to go get away from the things that we know about and replace them with things that are at least apparently safe. Um, and I, I'll tell you from my experience, you know, I, I was in my late thirties and I was suicidal because I couldn't sleep. It was really, really a bad thing. And through uh, arming thoughts, I didn't meditate, but I'm trying now. But just by reducing my levels of stress and taking these supplements nowadays, um, I have no trouble sleeping. It's really quite something to have gone from that state to this. And I think it's, it's entirely due to that shift. 
Yeah, this was a, this this uh, he touched a little bit on melatonin, like oral melatonin. The main focus was endogenous melatonin, just that we because we're producing it throughout our lifetime, it it naturally causes, in theory, calcification, and it's almost like this is our way of nature controlling our lifespan by naturally producing something that then calcifies a part of our body that then leads us to essentially no longer to have hypothalamic dysfunction and then and then aging and um in trying to reconcile that with like with the book with your book and the work sort of was trying to figure out that model like if if this is happening and if that's true sort of more centrally like let's say we really throughout our lifetime our our male pineal gland or hormone production glands like become toast because of things like this does that is that like a block towards some of this stuff working or is it a different mechanism and we can kind of bypass what might be happening centrally through through going straight to you know cellular epigenetic modifications and whatnot through through longevity therapies Uh, so do do you mean Specifically about the pineal gland calcification? Well, if there's irreversible changes that happen with aging like that, like, can we sort of, yeah. First of all, what I'd say is there's nothing that's irreversible in aging. Um, at least there's no reason to believe that it's irreversible. Uh, there are two things that people think are irreversible. Well, three things that we've proven are not irreversible. Blindness. Um, dementia and uh what was the third thing that i was thinking of uh oh um uh protein aggregations in tissues they they can get eaten up and uh, of course we've reversed vascular aging as well that was pretty easy we did that a few years ago so anyway but but is is pineal calcification reversible you know, I don't know. We can try it. I think that it probably is. If we just make the tissue younger, that'd be something to try. Um, you might know, Casey, I, I don't, but um, I do know melatonin um, will impact calcification even in the cardiovascular system, which you can try to uh, slow down using vitamin K2, which will keep the calcium out of the arteries and put it into the bones. But it, do we know if K2 will help the pineal gland? I don't know. That's a really interesting question. Not sure. Future directions. <laughs> yeah. But right. We should that, get the thing, um, mouse pineal glands. We throw them away. But uh, do, do you remember if mouse pineal glands get old and calcified as well? Because we could easily check that. I think so. I think so. Yeah. And um, I think some of this work was in, in mice. But but I think that the point you make that is so hopeful is that there this idea of reverse ver- irreversibility may be a more limited, uh, it may not be, uh, our paradigm of irreversibility may need to be updated and modernized. So I think that's a really uh, maybe good point for us to to end on of just like the body has a remarkable adaptive capability uh, when it has the right conditions. One more thing that we reversed that I forgot to say is the ultimate irreversible aspect of aging, which is senescence. Um, once you know the trick, it's easy to make a senescent cell healthy again. Wow. Perfect. So never say never. 